All set. Hi, everyone. I've been given the thumbs up that we're to start, but Apple says it's 10.59. But uh, um, I want to thank everyone for joining us in shifting culture and, uh, and managing change. I want to start off by acknowledging that we're on the, uh, the land on which we gather is the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, I want to just in quickly introduce myself. I'm a psychiatrist. Uh, my name's Dan Boston. I work in Victoria. Um, last time I actually had to announce anything of importance, I told an entire operating room and my wife that couldn't see anything that we'd had a, a boy. We didn't have a boy. We have a lovely little girl. Um, um, so clearly, uh, clearly I'm up on stereotypes and know nothing from the neck down. Um, speaking of stereotypes, uh, being a physician, we're never on time, so I, I actually really question why Andrew Ray asked me to do this. But um, anyway, um, today is rapid fire, and rapid literally means rapid. Um, so we have uh, 20 minutes per uh, presenting group. We have three fantastic groups. So there's going to be 10 minutes uh, uh, for presentation, uh, eight minutes for questions uh, and discussion, and then two minutes for transition. Um, I, I have it on good authority that uh, most of the speakers are quite friendly and you can come up and talk to uh, at the end, maybe not Amon, but I think everyone else uh, <laughs> you should be safe with. Um, anyway, so I want to uh, start and just hand off to Steve. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for being here. I know this is, you know, pre-lunch, so, you know, thank you for hanging in there. Uh, my name is Steve Tierney. I'm a GP. Uh, I've been with South Central Foundation for 25 years as a GP, and, uh, and I've been the medical director for quality improvement for 21 years. Um, so what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about how we leverage change, how we, cha how we work with the organization for uh, sort of uh, t to guide where it is that we want to go. Uh, initially, oh, we well, already got that, you know. Um, uh, initially, when the tribe took over, we were a First Nations organization. So the tribe took over in the 90s, really, f from a practical standpoint, you know, the delivery of health care services. And the tribe, since they were the recipients of health care, said the government was not making a real sort of, how should we say, successful effort with this, in their opinion. And they said, what what could we do to do something different? So they came up with what I will call and, and uh, prime directives to say, if we're going to do this as a startup, where would we want to go? Why would we want to go? And we thought it was really important to actually say specifically, what is it we're trying to achieve? Is it really just really super high fidelity to process? Or is it uh, really something else? Um, and what we really wanted to do is make sure the community was well in the eyes of the community as an equal peer partner as opposed to maybe a subordinate, which is what they felt like when they received services from the government in a more protocolized, mandated way. Uh, so what happened as a result of this is you think, how did it go? Well, we've been doing it for, let's say, 25 years or so, or a little bit more than that. And what happens is we actually have a problem. We have a wait list for doctors and nurses because we don't turn them over. Because what we've done is we've tried to say we need to do care, it needs to be high quality care, but it shouldn't be so oppressive a work environment that you hate it and you can't wait to leave or retire. <laughs> so what we found is we can actually reduce the visits to the A&E, reduce the hospital stays, while simultaneously keeping the customers and the um, staff happy. Um, but it presents a problem. As a medical director, I'm like, oh, what do I do? The guy's been with the organization for 10 years, and he's saying, I would like to move up to a more senior position, yet there are none. Should I be happy? Should I be upset? You know? um, so what we said is, okay, well, if we're really going to change this, how do we change it? We, we, we thought about why, but how do we do it practically? And what I've learned is, over the time you know, that I've been there, is there's three real major levers to managing change in an organization. One is training. Training is, of course, what we're all very comfortable with, what we're familiar with. Uh, there's also process, which we're particularly familiar with. But the third one is infrastructure. And I'm, I'm going to suggest that we have overemphasized the, uh, the deployments 
of training and process as a way forward. So, and let me tell you what that means. So if you have a bunch of people in an organization that don't know a topic, for instance, it's new, it's hepatitis C, there's new drugs, you know, training is a very good tool to deploy. But what about if you're performing below desired expectation for diabetes control, for vaccinations, for cancer screen, for other things like that? Do you get a room of medical professionals and say, hey, uh, boys and girls, we're going to uh, teach you about how important vaccinations are, and for the next hour, we're going to go over a PowerPoint, well, why you should vaccinate. What do you think the response of the audience is? They're going to go, are you freaking kidding me? Because, duh. So what we said is, if it's really straightforward, um, why are we training them? Because if they don't do it, it's because they can't. Because the organization's infrastructure, its design, isn't allowing them to do the easy thing, the right thing. So the second is process. What we found is, if there's a super clear, if this, then do that statement then we will say process works. If you need a flu shot, you should give a flu shot. If you have diabetes, you should get an A1C every six months. And, uh, and, uh, but I I if it's not clear, for instance, the dispensing of narcotics or the management of depression or the screening for some things, if it's not really clear, then can you use training to train people who already agree to use process to say one size will fit all, because we all know it does not, do you use a third way forward? We use what I call an infrastructure. And I like to think of this as coaching Wayne Gretzky. Do you get Wayne in a room and you say, Wayne, we've done some video analysis, and apparently you do not follow the best practice for shooting at a goal. We'd like you to drop your elbow a little bit and move, move your hand, you know, your non-dominant hand up a little bit, you know, because that's actually the process by which we should do this. So please comply because that's what we will measure you on. Or do we say, we're going to get out of Wayne's way and we're going to say, you do what you do and our job is to not clutter you with unnecessary process. How do we do that? Well, it means your measurement strategy needs to change. So it means that you want to support people for training and you want to look at the impact with measurement but not in professional centric measurement. Is it important that Steve, the GP, do a certain number of tasks very specifically or is it more important that Steve, after interacting with people, they get well, they get vaccinated, they don't get to the A&E? When what's the goal here? Is the goal to make me do a certain number of steps and measure that? Or is the goal to say, this is Wayne Gretzky? Tell Wayne what you want and let Wayne do it. So when we do this, we say, how do we support them? And then uh, how do we unhinge process? Because the problem with process is as soon as you institute a process, now you have to standardize it. Now you have to enforce it. Is there a if this, then that process for the dispense of narcotics? Well, if you have terminal cancer, actually you should proceed. If you're 30 years old and going through a divorce with a custody battle, maybe not. So how do we not prescript this to get out of the way of the staff, keep them happy, but recognize our goal, as long as we achieve it, it's okay. So what we do for infrastructure is we uh, actually say, how do we help you do what you do? Instead of telling you what to do for, for instance, opiates, I will add a behavioral health consultant physically in the clinic with you that you can use at will. I will add a pain psychiatrist. I will add a pain interventionalist. I will have an opiate review committee to review people who are on narcotics. But I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm going to make a Swiss Army knife that has more tools, and I'm going to get out of your way, but I'm going to measure the customer-measured outcome. So what do you want when it comes to opiates for non-terminally ill people? Anyone? down, right? Not telling a single thing, not doing a single training, not having a single process. Here's what happened when we supported them but got out of the way with opiate prescribing and non-terminal ill people. No process, no training, no nothing. Here's what happened when it came to the uh, pre and post uh, opiate quantity per month per customer. Here's what happened when we looked at the A&E visits, because we said, is this going to kill the A&E, where they're all going to run to the A&E after their GP cuts them off? And the answer is no. 
Here's what happens to the readmission rates at 30 days, because we said, are people going to decompensate and get sick? And we said, no, actually, it actually worked well. But we didn't prescribe, we didn't mandate, we didn't push. So that's it. And I made it on time. Uh, <laughs> And we have a conference about this, too, should you want to more granular detail. Uh, as, you know, the folks I work with know, he can go on for hours. You know, if you do. I, I did fail to mention that this is being live streamed on the Internet, so if anyone has questions, there is a microphone. There it is. So, questions, anyone? Hi, thank you. How much does payment model matter for the folks on your teams? A lot. All of our folks are all salaried. We will give you a bonus based on not process performance, but outcome performance, so, which is a different measurement model. I'm measuring the effect on the population of the people that you serve in their vaccination rates, their A&E rates, their readmission rates, their uh, access rates, their match with continuity, you know, uh, how quickly you answer the phone, how quickly you finish, you know, you know, things like that. So what we want to do is say, if we can reach people when they want to be reached, if we can keep them safe and well by vaccinating, cancer screening, controlling their chronic condition, we're good. And we'll measure those things, and we'll give you a bonus on your salary. But it's not productivity, which is, I think, an important thing to state. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, I've heard, you know, lots about South Central and NUCA systems and people go to conferences and you have a conference right there. there I'm interested in, in scale and spread and if, if you can provide some examples of people who have kind of heard your, your world and, and tried to emulate it and how that worked out. So we find there's an optimum team size when it comes to number of GPs and number of support infrastructures. So we generally have five or six GPs each with about 1,400 people on their panel. We age and gender adjust them, so there's a calculation for that. Um, but those five GPs each have a nurse assigned to them, you know, so they're a pair for that number of 1,400 or so that they have, and they have a clerk assigned to them. So the nurse is refilling all the meds, ordering all the vaccinations, uh, ordering all the cancer screens. The GP is signing them, but then the clerk who works for them is scheduling them. And the GP will oversee all of this, but then with these GP teams, there's generally five of that team together, uh, we'll augment them with two behavioral health consultants, master's level clinicians, one integrated pharmacist, one uh, uh, dietitian, and uh, let's see, pharmacist, dietitian, uh, and one midwife. Because why would we send you away for routine you know, prenatal care? Um, and then what we have done is since, is what I was sharing, you know, uh, is uh, we uh, have co-located our psychiatrists who will continue to do their nor normal workflow, but they'll be physically present close by the GP teams. So when they can say, hey, I just put somebody on Zyprexa, you need to check their glucose every X. Can you do that? Because yes, they can at a cheaper, higher capacity. So it means that we've built, and that, that will cover about 6,500 people or so, and so as we add blocks, we will add, you know, additional sort of component teams. So we could scale from about 6,000 up to 600,000 if we wanted to in these work units. I hope that makes sense. Okay. Be careful, if you don't ask anything, I'm going to make something up, you know. Feel for how your system interfaced with secondary care, uh, with hospital care? We are all, and don't hate us for this, we are all statewide on the same electronic medical record. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, not sorry, you know. <laughs> So, uh, essentially, you write an order in the electronic record, and they send it, and you can see it actually get scheduled in the electronic record, and you can see the cardiologist note. And what we did was hardwire it so any consultant note or any ER, uh, A&E visit, or any admission automatically copies to the GP team, nurse and doctor. 
So it means that even if they didn't see it, even if they didn't initiate it, they will know of it. But it means, though, that we have essentially uh, in EHR mail, where we could direct mail back and forth between the consultant and the GP team. What this does to the consultants is it says, I'm a cardiologist. I love to do casts, and I love to do treadmills, and I love to do stints. I hate following up LFTs and cholesterols. Could you do that for me? And the answer is, sure. No problem. But what we have is a clear sort of line of agreement to say, I would rather you spend more days doing caths and less days doing refills of somatostatin. This I can handle. You offer me a within 48 hours, no begging, no crying, uh, routine consult for a treadmill, which they can as a result of that. So it's work redistribution to say it needs to be done, but I don't want to pay $500 US an hour to do cholesterol monitoring. So as an indigenous organization, how often do you use traditional healers or traditional medicine in your practice? You will laugh at this. We actually, in the medical buildings, have a traditional healing clinic, and they write their notes and get referrals in the electronic record. We actually had to make a note template for them because the language typically used in a medical intervention does not fit what they would use. Um, so you make a referral to traditional healing. You do so as if it was the nephrologist. And uh, they go to traditional healing. They write their notes. You can see the encounters. Um, here's what's interesting is how does it work technically? I do not know. <laughs> However, I can m measure that the use of the A&E and the hospital and the use of benzos or narcotics is reduced consequent to an interaction with the traditional healing clinic. So what are they doing down there? This is Wayne Gretzky. I don't care. Because <laughs> they're saving a heck of a lot of money. And I'm good with that. You know? <laughs> so yeah. So, so the answer is absolutely. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yes, ma'am. traditional healers? You know, I don't know off the top of my head. I should know this. Uh, my other half runs uh, HR is one of her things. Um, I, you know, I don't know. Uh, James, would you know? He, he's, uh, James Sears is one of our, our staff members. Would you know how much they're paid? Tr traditional healers, how much are they paid? Do you know? I don't know. I'd have to get back to you I on should that. know this. My wife's a traditional healer. I work for <laughs> <laughs> So I feel on the spot here. <laughs> I'd we say, will uh, tell her. She works uh, three-quarter time, so I'd say full-quarter time maybe, but she's been there for 10 years plus, maybe 80000 or so in the U.S. That's probably a rough ballpark. Yeah. Yeah. And it adds value to the system. Because, and, and arguing about the mechanism is irrelevant. This is, what did we want done? Redu reduce A&E, reduce hospital, reduce narcotics, reduce benzos, reduce a other anxiolytics. As long as that happens, the mechanism is, it's your Wayne Gretzky. Do what you do. Okay, well, I'm at time. Thank you, yeah. Well, thanks so much. Fantastic. Thank you, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Uh, so next up is shifting the culture of care in long-term care homes. Hi. Oh, we missed a slide where I say I have nothing to disclose, so nothing to disclose, guys. Um, oh, hey. Uh, now we're working together. Let's see. Well, I'm not sure. I'm just figuring out the interface here as a designer, guys. Give me two seconds. I want to go back to the beginning. Interesting. Oh, okay. Um, so my name is Lisa Bolton. Uh, I'm the manager for the Health Design Lab at Emily Carr. We're working on a project called Shifting the Culture of Care and Long-Term Care with Vancouver Coastal Health. We've been working on that project since uh, about this time last year and it will continue through until October of next year. Um, so what is a Health Design Lab? It's a research centre at Emily Carr that blends these three disciplines of design and focuses on these methodologies in order to engage people uh, and the experience of creating the world that they want to be a part of. Um, these terms get thrown around a lot, so I thought I'd just take a second to dem demystify what those might look like. 
Um, so there's this idea of classical research and co-design. Uh, in co-design, you're really doing the research with the people or the users. It's kind of uh, using tools that are creative and oftentimes gives an opportunity for people to think more optimistically or openly about the future or describe how they're having challenges in a different way. Another way to think about this is these three triangles that we use all the time. So in traditional research, you might do interviews or observation, and that's kind of getting to what people are thinking or observing what they're doing in situations and kind of monitoring that. Well, the generative co-creative se sessions are kind of engaging more tacit or latent knowledge in the body. It's kind of the same way that, you know, I could try to tell you how to tie your shoelace or I could show you. There's an innate knowledge in the body that we rarely access within research, and that's what the generative co-design sessions support a lot. So let's get to the project. So shifting the culture of care is really about empowering the voice of the people living in long-term care and creating what the future of care will be for them. It's about shifting from an institutional model of care to a person-directed social model of care. So what do we mean? I think oftentimes we talk about patient-centered. Well, we really want to shift that even further to person-directed. Uh, and we use design research methodologies in order to lift the voice and choice of the people that live in these long-term care homes. And this is how we hope to support a culture change. So around this time last year, we engaged with five different Vancouver Coastal Health Care homes in co-creative activities, um, asking people questions like, uh, what does good care look like to you? And as a result of all the kind of input that we received from people, uh, the people in long-term care expressed these five themes as ways that they would like to see their culture shifted. Uh, and instead of me breaking these down for you, I thought I'd share uh, five videos with you. I'm going to turbo. I might have to skip some because I'm assuming you're going to give me time warnings. Um, so these were created with people living in long-term care homes, narrated by people living in long-term care homes, and there's also a Cantonese version that we've created. So first we'll talk about creating a sense of purpose. I don't really need to be in the kitchen, but just be part of some of the cooking is great. I didn't know someone could be interested in my stories. Hey, I'm here. I'm alive. So a sense of purpose speaks to um, a purpose-driven life, that in a long-term care setting, all your basic needs are cared for. And so oftentimes you'll uh, lose a sense of what you're able to do. And the idea of what meaningful activity instead of just activity like watching TV gets lost a little bit. I love to play games with other people, even when I'm not very good at it, or if it's just talking about games I used to play. The human connection is important to me. I was pretty upset when I first moved in here, but some stuff stuck with me, and we are friends now. Activities can give the boost, but relationships can give purpose. You never know when there is a soul out there that matches your own. I know, we're all going to cry, guys. <laughs> um, so how are we creating a sense of belonging in a long-term care home? And how are people feeling free to express what they want? Uh, I think oftentimes, I think we've all heard of people not feeling encouraged to not be a bother. Recognizing and supporting ability. I love playing the piano. I think I used to be quite good at it, but it's been so long since I even touched the keys. I think I just need some encouragement and someone willing to help me try, to re try again. I fell in love with watercolors at the art night in my care home and we had a small exhibition. I was shocked, but someone actually bought my painting. While that part was nice, I was just happy my skill was recognized. I might need help, but I would appreciate it if you asked me first. Disease doesn't mean I can't do it. It just means it takes time. 
So when we talk about supporting ability, I think that sometimes in a care situation you can assume that people can't do things or as a result of that people feel that they've lost their skills as a result of not having used them for a long time. So somehow the culture is limiting how people think about their activity or their um, ability um, and it's not really fostering a sense of independence. I met with a dietitian, which allowed me to not only get enough vitamins that I need, but also to connect with my culture. Now I get to eat dumplings that remind me of the ones my grandmother used to make. Since there's no one to speak in my language, I'm worried about losing it. I hope I can have access to books, movies, or radio that has my language. I spoke with a staff member about feeling disconnected about my beliefs. She was able to bring in the pastor for me in help to fill a gap. So of course this idea of individual needs of ca and care is that we are un all indeed individuals and that when that's taken away from us in a long-term care setting, we feel like we're losing a part of ourself um, where you're already losing so much. Um, yeah, so ad addressing these kind of independent care, care needs is incredibly important moving forward. Although it's a small thing, a nurse got the kitchen to pack a small paper bag lunch for me so I would have something to eat when I go out for a walk. I'm happy to enjoy my meal outside. One day, I had received upsetting news about my father and was crying. The care staff took the time to check on me, asked how I was and comforted me. It's nice when they are able to take the time to really care. I need someone who can be a translator of my needs to listen, interpret, and support me to do what I want. So with flexibility and spontaneity, I think it's a thing of living a very overscheduled life for both staff and people in long-term care homes. And that a result, as a result of that overscheduling, that we're limiting the opportunity for impromptu uh, situations or um, for the staff to be able to respond flexibly, flexible, flexibly to situations. So since we produced these five videos, we shared them at an event uh, with 16 care homes shared the videos with them, and did two different co-creative activities with them that kind of spoke to the possibility space of how we can reimagine our homes. This happened in October of last year. Um, as a result of this kind of work, we're now sharing the videos and these co-creative workshops with all the long-term care homes, so 55 of Vancouver Coastal Health's long-term care homes. And at the end of March, we will have another large-scale event with all 55 long-term care homes where we will create a co-creative toolkit that each of those homes will go home with. And that over the course of the next year, we'll continue to produce co-creative toolkits for people to be playing in the homes, so people living in long-term care homes, staff in long-term care homes, um, for everybody to be co-creating on their own. And in this way, we're hoping to build this capacity of co-design and empowering people to be a part of their care. Um, to kind of flip the hierarchy so that the people living in long-term care can be directors of their care in the way that they can and that they feel like they have some kind of empowered ability in that space. I just want to speak to the design of this for a sec because I think it's important. So the way that we frame aging is also very important and this is where design language comes in very strong. You'll notice in the videos um, that it was mostly hands or as birds used. This is expressive of all peoples um, and so this is kind of the design language and the way that we can reframe the way we're thinking about stuff and see it in a new opportunistic uh, space um, just by creating a different visual language around it and by using physical tools to describe a situation. So right now, actually right now, uh, the research assistants at, my, at the Health Design Lab are out in long-term care homes. They're prototyping what this co-creative toolkit will look like. I think they're going to see about 
eight to 10 care homes before we launch the co-creative kit, and we will continue to co-design what these games look like with the people living in long-term care. The current co-creative kit focuses around um, a sense of purpose, with the idea of building from that sense of purpose, empowering the voice, so that we can start to tackle the other themes that they expressed that were important to them. Uh, you can see these videos on these YouTube channels. It's in Cantonese and in English. We're hoping that people will go on there and translate into different languages because a big barrier here is that a lot of people are coming from a lot of different places and we want them to be able to access this. Uh, finally, we have a ton of projects going on and I'd love to tell you all about them at our showcase on the third. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Please ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you. That was awesome. I've been in many care homes as an occupational therapist and not seen this. So if I ever have to be, when I'm aging, I hope to be in something that you've developed. <laughs> I, was, I said this in a session before, but we did another um, workshop with uh, women post-childbearing age, and this was the, one of the large messages that came out of that co-creative session, is that they saw uh, their parents in aging and um, ending up in long-term care homes, and they were like, just don't let me end up there. Um, so I think it's a thing we're all, if we're lucky, we all get to age. So we will all be here, potentially. So that's yeah, important. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank um, you. Expression. I was wondering, are you also tracking the impact on the shifting culture? So delighted to raise that. And <laughs> because, like, I, I want you to succeed and, and, to, and to show that this has had an impact. So I'm just okay. giving you the floor. Okay, I'll just take mic here. <laughs> um, so I think this is a, a huge challenge that we have in the Health Design Lab. One, participatory design research isn't really uh, funded very well, um, but also that this idea of inclusion of people in the research has a lot of ethical dilemmas around um, neurodiverse folks, whether they're empowered to participate or not. Um, yeah, so the evaluation metrics are something that we've continuously been working with Vancouver Coastal Health to work out, but it's this thing of how do you measure the life experience of a person in a long-term care home? Is it that they smile more? You know, what is quality of life in long-term care? I get that there are outcomes in health where it's like I see that this number is going down and this number is going up, but when a home is treated like a hospital and the same metrics are being used to evaluate a measure of wellness, I just don't think it works, and I don't think that there is metrics that exist to support it. Therefore, this kind of work isn't being funded because there's no way to really say, you know, we're making a difference here, even though we know that we are, you know. So um, if anybody wants to bat that one around or get on board, I would really appreciate that because I think it is incredibly valuable work that isn't valued, you know. Can you repeat the question? What am I measuring? Yeah, well, so, I mean, for us, I mean, we are not necessarily measuring anything other than we're creating, uh, we're creating data that is the voices of the people. Uh, we started with the five long-term care homes as a result of the success of those co-creative events and the success of the spread of this video and the uh, empowerment of people. That is the success metric. So like it, when you say me this, is, this is kind of the conundrum of how do we want to measure what success looks like in the space of life experience. Um, and how do we do that in, with a group of people where some people may be nonverbal or, or have neurodiver neurodiverse spectrum? Um, I don't have the answer for it. What I do know is that Vancouver Coastal Health has courageously funded us to do this work over the course of two years because they see that it's making a difference and because I think there are metrics that are measuring life experience in long-term care homes, which largely relate to prescriptive practices, um, which don't equal the quality of life. How you prescribe has nothing to do with the quality of life of a person. So those um, traditional hospital health-based metrics just aren't going to apply here. 
Um, yeah, so I don't have a good answer for you there. I'm sorry. Fantastic talk. Um, nice. I'll just add to the research aspect. You, you, the um, academic community and the research community, I think, would act in partnership for this as well. So the shift in focus to measure different aspects and dimensions of quality would, there would be probably a significant number in this room who have expertise and methodology for that. Holler. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It was uh, really touching. Uh, thank you. Um, this is more like a curiosity question. I'm just wondering if you heard of any sort of like unique or innovative things that you heard during this co-design process. Uh, I can't remember where, but I read the study where they brought in like like a daycare school or like a preschool into like long-term homes just for an afternoon, just to let um, them interact with the, the those who are uh, present there and it really uh, improved their um, outlook and just happiness and things like that. In terms of, I don't know how they measured it, but I think it's just like what they um, qualitatively um, understood from talking to the residents. So did you hear anything like that interesting or unique? Yeah, I mean, so we have a number of programs with the Health Design Lab that are really about creating intergener intergenerational relationships between people in co-design, in, in creative production, in storytelling. Our focus, of course, is more at the university level. Um, certainly any kind of meaningful interaction, I think this comes back to the question of what is meaningful interaction? Um, being with a young child, having them listen to your stories, hearing their wild and zany ones, this is a meaningful interaction. What is the metric for that? I don't know. Um, but yeah, so I think that there are a number of programs that kind of uh, are engaging people in long-term care in a different way, although I don't think that they are necessarily um, pervasive. Uh, and I think it's, uh, there's lots of community par partnerships that are possible. I think it's just a matter of ha having the bandwidth to support them oftentimes. <gasps> Hi. Hey, very great friend. presentation. I'm uh, Remy, I'm a designer, <coughs> design researcher from England. I come from France, so pardon my accent. It's <laughs> French French, not Canadian French. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, I'd like to come back on that uh, notion of evidence uh, because it's something, so I'm a designer as well and we uh, at Lab for Living in England, we are really struggling with um, providing that sort of evidence. So I'd like to question like what is that evidence? It's something like whatever has been installed up until now is based on two quantitative measures which are easy to actually measure because it's quantitative you can quantitify, uh, quantity, you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's, it's something, um, the quality of life and having been involved in a number of projects um, where we deliver co-design workshops as well with a bunch of people uh, following heart attacks, strokes, uh, people living with dementia or living with uh, disabilities, all those people who are actually involved in the process for some of them, it's actually been very therapeutic and there are a lot of emotions and a lot of uh, kind of, um, yeah, um, things that are being released in the process. And I'd say even this, the simple fact that they are involved in those projects is actually massively impactful on these people. And yeah, and, and my experience also is that all those core design methods that we apply into the design process is uh, often followed in the final kind of outcome, results of whatever is being designed. And from that respect, you can somehow um, um, project the methods and the, the benefits that we've uh, managed to apply for these people in the research process into the outcomes. So. Can I say one more thing before they kick me off? Oh God. Uh, so I think that how we reverse things, I think in like the scientific method, you come up with a hypothesis, you come up with a method and you try and say one way or the other if this hypothesis co is correct. In a, in a design research perspective, you are coming in without a hypothesis, hypothesis. So that is informed by the people that are participating in the research. And you're almost doing a lot more problem finding and finding the right problems and then working with those people to figure out what could that look like? So it's flips everything upside down, which is my favorite way. Thank you. Thank you. That was excellent. I think, I hope there's someone that's involved with patient-oriented research in the room to be able to, to connect. 
Um, so definitely two talks I wouldn't want to follow, but I think the next talk is going to be fantastic as well. So we are going to have working together to build physician QI capability. Great. Uh, welcome everyone to our presentation. Um, we're going to be sharing uh, the PQI program in terms of the formation of it and the components of it. And we'll try to share different perspectives of our partners that are part of this. You'll see on our first slide that this truly represents a partnership. A lot of different organizations and folks came together to make this happen. Um, I'm pleased to present this with very passionate colleagues, uh, Dr. Monty Martin and Dr. Uh, Devin Harris. Um, we don't have any um, conflicts or declarations um, to share. Um, <clears throat> this slide really represents uh, my experience of being in the program for the last five years and, and the space that was afforded to us. Really, that the best way to predict your future is to create it. And we've had the space and autonomy, and, and, and we continue to have that. And I think this is so important for this initiative. Um, before we talk about the SSEPQI, I just want to quickly give an overview of where this is kind of housed. So senior leaders at the ministry and doctors of BC came together and created these joint collaborative committees. And under the specialist services committee is where this initiative was uh, afforded that space for birth. Um, these committees are, their mandate is collaboration, transformation, and, and physician engagement. We've got co-chairs from the Ministry of Health and Doctors of BC, and every health authority sits on these committees. And they, they've been up and running now for over 10 plus years. Um, under the SSE, we have a number of initiatives. The two flagship files are uh, physician quality improvement and uh, uh, facility engagement. Um, and for PQI, it's housed under this uh, bucket called developing physician capability. So uh, where did this initiative come from and, and how was it kind of created? So when SSC looked at its activities and saw there's an opportunity to um, get into the space of quality, they first looked under the hood of the joint clinical committees, what's happening, what's working, what's not. And there's a couple of initiatives that are listed there. They also looked outside of British Columbia to see how can we learn from high performing health systems. So Cleveland Clinic was visited. And, and, the, and a couple of years ago, we actually went down to the Mayo Clinic. And the learnings from these were instrumental in terms of creating the Physician Quality Improvement Program. The high overarching goal of the initiative is to work in collaboration with the health authorities to enhance capability in quality improvement. And all of this is for uh, driving a culture change here in BC. At the bottom here is a picture. We had a summit a couple of years ago where Don Burick was invited and a senior fellow from the Mayo Clinic. He, and they had a private meeting with the CEOs and board chairs of our six health authorities. And Don Burick said that BC is very fortunate. You're the right size. You're not too big and you're not too small to actually do some of this culture change work. So um, how, uh, another key element of this program was uh, when initially we launched it, we had a meeting with the VPs of medicine and the corporate directors and VPs of quality. And we had a conversation about what's your current quality structure, where you're trying to go, and what's working and what's not. Even though these meetings were held with the six health authorities separately, a common message came back, which was a lot of folks are participating in quality, but the doctors aren't. And please work with us. Let's, let's change this. I'm going to... Pass it over to my colleague. Hey, uh, well, thanks, Simon. And uh, in creating this initiative, in creating our future, we agreed there were four key elements, uh, as you see. And uh, over the next uh, few slides, we're going to touch on each one of them. And as Amon mentioned earlier, these uh, four elements came from collaboration and uh, between the Joint Collaborative Councils. It came from our visit to Cleveland Clinic and our experiences with uh, health authorities. Uh, Province-wide, we have a unified goal, uh, but that goal recognizes and embraces diversity. And because of that, the operational aspect of PQI varies between each health authority and incorporates uh, each health authority's local needs. Now, the joint steer PQI uh, steering committees uh, are uh, focal points. Uh, there's one in each health authority. And the... Um, 
you know, we recognize that um, life is never made unbearable by circumstances, only by a lack of mission, meaning, and purpose. And these committees uh, form the focal point of, uh, of helping to uh, generate that mission and purpose. In any high-performing uh, organization, mission uh, and purpose are aligned from, from uh, throughout the entire organization, and uh, in that way, everyone uh, spends their times on, th on things that are worthwhile rather than uh, uh, waste uh, such as uh, conflict. And the, the um, four groups listed in the slides work together um, to uh, uh, make decisions through consensus. We have uh, two patient representatives, uh, or at least we aim for two on each group, and those uh, have proportional geographic uh, representation. Uh, we have a number of physician uh, uh, champions, including a, a, a part-time physician QI advisor. Uh, we have representatives from our specialist service committee. And uh, most importantly, we have uh, sponsors uh, from our health authority, the um, uh, uh, Executive Medical Director of Medical Quality, our, our VP from each health authority is sponsored, uh, and other uh, senior operation leaders. Now, decision making is not made in Victoria or Vancouver, but it's decentralized, and it's a successful model. In over 100 meetings, we've never had a single issue that we've had to uh, raise to a higher level to break a stalemate. Uh, the Joint PQI Committee manages the budget, and this gives each health uh, committee and each health authority uh, significant autonomy uh, to um, develop programs, provide oversight, uh, select cohort physicians, and represent the values of our stakeholders. Uh, this model has produced a high level of physician engagement because the Joint Committees uh, produce pride of ownership for the projects that they shepherd. That pride rightly extends to our clinical colleagues who are doing the work, and it comes from the one thing that matters most, improving the care that we're delivering to our patients. Now, the second key element of QI is training, and the uh, training is for the purposes of building our provincial QI uh, capacity. A huge amount of our time and effort goes into delivering a great educational experience, and we've been successful. Like, based on this, one of our uh, graduates uh, was he liked it so much he bought the company and he wound up becoming a VP of quality in one of our uh, major institutions. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, most, uh, uh, the, uh, most of our physicians um, are comfortable engaging in clinical research but not as comfortable in QI and having access to local training was, uh, was uh, instrumental in uh, uh, helping uh, drive engagement. Um, across the province, there's many different options for uh, development, and those are chosen by the uh, individual QA joint committees. And given that QA is a team effort, we realize it's important to move beyond traditional silos, and 40% of our memberships are GPs. And we've uh, recently started programs which include uh, dyad leadership teams, uh, that is both medical and operational leaders. So a PQI training is based on a dosing strategy that has been developed by IHI and used by many organizations. It allows for flexibility and opportunity. Um, physicians can uh, train at their own pace. Uh, based on this, we've set uh, significant uh, targets for our, our collective uh, six health authorities with an overarching goal of, of cultural change. And cultural change will only take place once we've reached a critical mass of physicians. Our level one targets are substantial and they're driven by our experience at Mayo Clinic where 100% of the um, uh, uh, healthcare uh, colleagues, thank you, um, uh, will have level one or bronze training uh, as they call it. And uh, we're aiming for um, a 75,000 uh, people through the province and this will lay the uh, foundation for the enthusiasm and success of our mo more advanced level two uh, training cohorts. Uh, finally, uh, at least for me, my part, Dr. Uh, Harris is going to be up soon. Uh, movement is huge. We've put through tw uh, 17 uh, training cohorts with hundreds of physicians who have received their certificates. It's important to celebrate uh, this uh, achievement and thank participants uh, uh, in our PQI graduation uh, ceremony ceremonies. And uh, now I hand the floor over to uh, Dr. Devin Harris, who's the Executive Director of Quality and Safety at Interior Health. And I'll be, um, thanks Monty, I'll be quick because I'll be the color man and as the play-by-play -play went first as well. 
So in this capacity, despite the red shoes and red vest, I am, um, I normally wear a suit. So I'm Executive Medical Director of Quality Patient Safety and Interior Health. And the key um, piece to this, I find in my role of leadership and, and being a sponsor for PQI within Interior Health is culture change. And so that's my whole purpose behind it. And within this, the physicians who work within PQI do a learning action, action project. So like many of you have done Quality Academy or Clinician Quality Academy, it's not just the methodology of quality improvement, it's actually the fact that they get down and dirty of something they're interested to be able to take forward. So the dose response, this speaks to the cohort specifically. So in each of the um, of, uh, health authorities, the decision to have a physician come in of interest, and it's voluntary, people are tagged to want to do it, but it's based either on projects, which are really good and aligned with health authorities, or people. So it doesn't really matter as long as there is the interest in what people have called the fire in the belly to be able to take something on. That's how people have been involved with the PQI as well. The fourth and final component piece to this at the health authority level is the team of the supportive team, which is sponsored by PQI. And within it, there's up to seven uh, pieces. So a manager for PQI overall, administrative support, a coordinators or coaches or consultants, a key part is a data analyst, I got the red, and uh, the physician QI advisors of which some of you are here as well. So there's the, the team that's supportive of the docs who are doing the work and interested to do it are as crucial as the physicians who are there as well. From a governance perspective, I won't go through much of that m any further just to go through, but 95% of the funding that comes from PQI is within the yellow bars right there. And from a structure of governance, it does liaise with the specialist services committees ultimately. From the um, metrics that go into what we're looking at, and I'll fliply go through this as well, but they are and measuring the impact on physicians before and after to say that there is increased engagement, there's increased knowledge, there's increased confidence, uh, and, and from testimonials of what the docs have said, it gives them an opportunity where they feel that there's something they want to improve on, this, on the care area that might not get picked up from the health authority, which is me, but they get an opportunity to lead something and move it forward. And then we as the health authority end picking it up. Um, a key component piece to this as well as the acknowledgement that is hard work and time's up, it says. And so board chairs and graduations, um, we acknowledge those who have gone through it as well. That was the previous physician advisor from, um, uh, from Interior, but the recognition at each time that it is a significant amount of work and time to acknowledge. And without, I'll let you briefly look at this because I've seen the red as well and open for questions, but from my view as a, um, uh, with as an executive medical director in a health authority, is that this actually is an opportunity to change culture. So the docs who are out there who have good ideas, A, might not have protected time to do it as an individual, but B, really do have fantastic ideas. And this is the way that they're able to do it. And as you've noticed, we have more docs here at the Quality Forum this year, a lot of them related to PQI projects, more people presenting as well. Um, so I think from our perspective, the other part, one last thing, is our health authority was last to the table. <laughs> Uh, and what we learned from the other health authorities, and within that we learned very early on, you have to mesh it with the current quality structures of the health authority. So you're not going to do anything by yourself unless you have a dyad. You're not going to be able to do anything else unless you have operational support. If it's not a health authority priority, it's very difficult to run as well. So we made certain to embed it within the quality structures of the health authority, and that has been um, transformative. Thank you very much for your time. I'm curious how you've allocated the funding or support to the different health authorities. Because they're all so variable in regards to population and uh, the number of physicians. <coughs> yeah, great question. So initially the SSE allocated $1.2 million per health authority. And that was to provide $700,000 for the staff and $500,000 for the sessional money. Uh, last year we got a 40% lift and we kind of used some additional factors and popped up that money. So it's all the same even though the health th the authorities are, are quite different in regards to um, the like size, size, you're right, yeah. Some have more physicians, some have less. We've done that in the first round. The second round we try to account with other factors, um, but so far the programs haven't hit that upper ceiling with the money. When they need the money we go back higher up and show the value and try to get more money. So it hasn't been an issue yet. Um,
How do you balance uh, keeping early adopters engaged at which time where it takes time to actually change the culture and tip things? And I know health authorities and physicians haven't always had the best working relationships. And, and I guess I'm actually asking about sustainability for the early adopters. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. So, a great, great question. So, the, within the PQI structure, that was the recognition. So those who have gone through already and have um, early adopters and fantastic, the, that was set from the steering committee and otherwise within health authorities as a key target, that we need to have a sustainability aspect to funding. So that now exists. So meaning that those who have done a project in a cohort, they can continue on in a way that it does because we, we know that it takes time to build things up. Uh, we know that it takes time to have interest. The other part that's behind it as well is the linkages to the health authorities and our thinking within the health authorities that these are our future leaders. So from a governance perspective, the, the, our department heads, our others who are doing it as well, we want these people to be embedded, embedded and sprinkled throughout from a leadership perspective and physician leadership perspective. So it's almost from, um, from that, it's a, um, um, a leadership development succession pipeline that they actually get into significant operational roles as well. Does that answer it? And just to follow up on that, um, uh, I'd be interested in hearing from you guys about the the vision. You know, Don Berwick was saying BC was a, like a right place for this. There's a tipping point. What what is that? What's, what happens when when that tipping point is met? Like, what are we? What's the picture there? What's the vision? You need a presentation of culture this morning. So yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> I don't. Uh, people keep giving it back to me. I can let them. You guys say something too. I'm the one who's hanging my neck out on this. Um, it's, an en it's an engaged workforce. I, I mean, that's the key behind anything from a quality improvement perspective is the part that we're not doing it on our own. And um, payment models and funding structures and governance and organization around it has been and, and possibly is a barrier to us moving forward to be able to improve care. I mean, from, a, from you've just heard before us, from a system design or co-design perspective, patients and families don't give a darn how we fund ourselves, how we organize ourselves. They wanna know what the experience of care is. So I think from a culture that we, we have done numbers and looked at what the tipping point is and what the, you know, once you get to a, a level and there's methodology and research behind it. But to that, we'll all know that point when we actually realize that we're working together as a group and there won't be a barrier to doing this from a payment perspective or funding perspective or otherwise. And the first bit to this is culture change from an engagement, but then the next bit is actually the methodology. And that's the part that we're really getting is that the docs really understand QI methodology because uh, from the quality, quality council's perspective, mostly it was non-physicians who went through quality academy and understood the language and the ability to make system change and improvements. That's not anymore. There's a ton of docs out there who have learned this now. So. Yeah, just to add a quick thing in, uh, to Dr. Harris's uh, uh, eloquent comments that, you know, the vision is that every uh, healthcare practitioner in BC will consider them part of a provincial effort uh, 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 engaging QI to benefit our patients. And it's particularly powerful because as uh, physicians, nurses, pharmacists, uh, administ uh, administrators are special people, mm -hmm. and you'll see, uh, <laughs> in the, in the, see why in a sec. So uh, as physicians and nurses, we help one patient at a time. But when you do a QI project, you have the capability of uh, helping uh, tens, hundreds, thousands, even potentially millions of people province-wide and our administrators are special because they're already in positions that, that can, can do the, help us do that. So that, that's uh, part of the vision. It should be part of all of our jobs to be uh, working in continual uh, quality improvement within BC and part of a provincial identity. So when we go to conferences nationwide, we'll be able to say, well, look at the efforts that we're doing in BC while well, we're, we're quite proud of that. and. Uh, but the most important thing, of course, is, is to make things better for our patients. Yeah, it's lunchtime. But thank you, everyone, for your time. But, but, but before you go, um, I, please ask that you do your uh, evaluations because the presenters would really appreciate it. And you know, thank you for being such a great uh, engaged audience. Thank you. And thank you to the presenters. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for keeping us on time. Yeah.